back in May when I first came to interview you. Um, how's your life changed since then? Um, well, mostly the petitions happened and that's gone absolutely crazy. But it's, I feel like it's getting better, more hopeful than since then. And, and how have you coped with the, uh, the, the pressures of dozens of reporters trying to speak to you? And uh, well, I've had support from people like Sharon and Luke and all my other friends. And, you know, it's been taking them one at a time, then splitting up the workload. And the idea of the petition, was that Luke's idea? Or did, did, did you talk to him about it? Or did he um, suggest it to yeah, you? Yeah, I'd say it was mostly his idea. Like, he'd been wanting to do it for a while. And then we decided eventually, you know, when the last two, three weeks before I can actually go to Oxford, or the last month was it. Yeah. And we figured, we may as well try it. And it's gone absolutely crazy. Because you had absolutely nothing to lose at that stage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, were you getting concerned that the, the deadline was approaching, getting closer and closer, and yet you were still getting no answer, no kind of response back from the Home Office? Yeah, so I hadn't heard from the Home Office in about two, three months. And the, the last thing they just said was they have the application, they're sorting it. And that didn't really tell me anything. So it was concerning that nothing had happened since. And they knew of the deadline you faced with uh, the, uh, the place at Oxford? Yeah, it was outlined in the application I actually made. So there's loads of extra details explaining my situation and why I need to actually stay. And do you believe that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, petition has obviously added a great deal of uh, um, pressure to the Home Office? Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, done tremendously. So uh, 80,000 people <laughs> all saying they'd like me to stay. Can't be nothing, really. And how does that feel to suddenly find there are 80, you've got 80,000 <laughs> friends you never knew existed? <laughs> uh, it's uh, am amazing, overwhelming, really. And, and, and what about the support that you've had from Sharon and people at uh, uh, Heathfields and, and people, have, I'm sure there have been down times during this long battle you've had to stay in the country. Oh, yeah, there's been loads of little, you know, laws where I was worried that we aren't going to make it in time and they still have them from time to time. But there's still astounding support from people like Sharon and Martin and Luke and everyone else in there really. And they pick you up when you're feeling a bit low? Yeah, so they're still looking ahead and seeing, you know, the end goal. But, but you, you are, you strike me as being a fairly phlegmatic lad. I mean, you've been through an awful lot in your life so far. Uh, problems that most people would have failed to cope with. You've managed to uh, survive all of those and seem almost untouched by them. <laughs> it's, it's difficult, I'm sure, that beneath the surface uh, you've suffered over those years, have you, in the past? Um, yeah, yeah, I've gone through loads of things and I do worry all the time, like quite stressed most of the time. But I think with all the support I have, it's manageable. So, you know, it's not just me fighting alone. I've always got people I can rely on when I need to. Yes. And what's been your lowest moment? Um, lowest moment? Maybe you haven't had one, I don't know. I can't think of any one big defining moment. It's just been, you know, one long low moment really. So it's been, hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's one big defining moment I can think of. But it's, it's been one low moment, so it's been a, a depressing time for you. Yeah. Whilst an uncertain time. Yeah, yeah, that. And how, I mean, has it affected your sleep? I mean, how, how has your life changed as a result of those pressures? Um, well, I feel like I'm a lot more indecisive because I can't really tell what I'll be doing in about two, three months or where I'll be. So I can't really plan for the future in any way. So I have to take each day as it comes and try to see what I can do today and not worry too much about tomorrow. And whereas before you were somebody who was always making long-term plans. Really. Yeah. So before I, you know, had more options than that. Yes, yes. And, and, and now the end is nigh, one hopes. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be negative. I'm sure that, uh, you know, if God's kind, what, what should happen will happen. Um, and I'm sure that the support that you've received has done no harm to that uh, campaign for sure. But do you still think at all about what happens if it doesn't get the right answer and uh, you're going to be facing deportation? I try to keep it completely out of my mind because I honestly don't see what I'd be doing if I was deported. And I don't think I can plan that far ahead because it's completely new ground. And, and if you were to be deported, uh, I know that Luke has said, and I'm sure this is correct, you don't have any contact or contacts 
in that country at all. No, nope, I haven't been back there in over seven or eight years, so that be Zimbabwe. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and you have, as, as an orphan, you have no family roots in the country at all? No, not that I know of, at least. No, and no friends? And so it would be a, a, a disastrous situation for yeah. you to be sent back there to, uh, to, to, to nothing, basically. And to compare that with, with the opportunity that uh, Oxford offers you, just, just outline what you believe that that will help, where will aid you, how it will aid you. We're, we're getting to Oxford, what, what will that mean to your life? Um, well, it'll give me a chance to actually, you know, start planning on my future again. And start thinking in long-term decisions and you know get to keep my friends keep my family around get to meet new people go in new places and potentially open up new avenues for my future like getting a good job you know may possibly give them back to communities that i've been part of and helping other people avoid this kind of situation if i can yes and i mean one of the things you've done of course in the in the interim is to spend time trying to help people at uh, Heathfields. Uh, yeah, Highfields. Oh, so, so big, but Highfields. <laughs> um, so I spent a year as a teaching assistant, voluntary, and it was a really interesting year. I enjoyed most of it, and it was a good learning experience. And and what what are you looking forward to most uh, from Oxford? Um, probably the meeting new people from different places, while also learning in one of the best places in the in, in this world. Yeah, the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know. And had you heard of Oxford before you, Oxford University, before you came to this country? Um, I'd heard the name, but I didn't actually understand all the cloud prestige. The prestige, yeah. The prestige that, you know, they had behind them. And so how did you feel when Sharon and her colleagues first suggested that you should apply to Oxford? Um, at the time, I just thought it was just another university, you know, just one that was ranked high, higher than others. And I was like, OK, let's go for it if we can. And then when you heard that you'd uh, secured a place there, what was your reaction to that? Um, I was absolutely astounded. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing to actually have made it to one of the best places in the world. And, you know, I really did feel like I belonged there when I went on interview and absolutely loved it. And then you heard that you could be deprived of that place. Uh, and then what, what was your reaction when you first heard that news? Um, I think that was, you know, one of the worst things that have happened. So, to go from possibly one of the best highs ever to finding out I might not be in the country anymore, I might not go to uni, might not see my friends, it was just shattering really. But you were still able to pick yourself up from that? Yeah, because I had to, you can't just stop fighting. And do you think that's as a result of your background up till then, the kind of the, the former problems that you coped with? I, I believe so, so I think that's given me a fighting, you know, spirit, a will to go on, rather than just giving up at the first sign of trouble. And that resilience has obviously been of great worth during the last two years of your life. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you have any uh, ambitions? Well, I'm sure you've got lots of ambitions, uh, but uh, do you have any idea what you'd like to do with the rest of your life after completing an Oxford degree? At the moment, no. I mean, I tell myself I'm going to do research because that's what interests me at the time because I'm interested in, you know, finding out more and all is learning. But I could be anywhere after the degree. Right, and is, is that because you daren't think ahead or is that simply because you're a pragmatic guy who uh, waits until the right moment to make a decision? Uh, I think it's a bit of both, quite honestly. So with all this going on, I don't really have time to sit down and think, okay, what would I like to do in, you know, three years, four years, maybe five, because I don't know I'll be in two months. And if you get the right decision, what would be the first thing you do? <laughs> um, probably celebrate with all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just post it everywhere. To celebrate for the next few days, be really happy. Then start preparing for uni and... Pack your bags. Yeah, get ready. Good. <laughs> I wish you all the best. And thank, thank you very you. much for talking to us.